Hello and welcome to Penelope's Chinwag. My name's Penny and I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete. I've been making these videos now for three years in July and if you've stuck with me, I know so many of you have watched every episode and oh, seen what's gone on in my life because that's what Penelope's Chinwag really is. It's a diary. A crafting diary, going out for walks where I visit, just a diary of my life, what's gone on. Babies being born, I lost my mum last year. Yeah, Pete not being well, uh, now thankfully he's recovering. So if you'd like to uh, join me, uh, please do. Um, if you like to craft, uh, yeah, I'll show you my crafts and I'm planning on doing a new segment which is showing you how if you're a complete beginner absolute beginner how to make a quilt and that's underway I started to get the fabrics out yesterday and uh, hopefully that won't be long and that'll be with you I did have from one darling viewer she asked me um, and you know who you are um, would I show you what's on the back of my chair? Well, it's not on the back of my chair this week. It's here. And it's The Dust of Snow by Helen Stewart. I just use bits of wool that I have left over, probably about 10 grams of each one. Very, it's very pastel, this one. I have done one which is quite bolder in yellows and purples uh, for a friend. I've also done one for my daughter. She's more pinky, but it's lovely. It's really lovely, soft. And so that's with floof. And as I say, the four ply sock, the indie dyed wool. And the other one that uh, it was on the back of my chair is the habitation throw just again using oddments not too big not like the one on my uh well it's on my sofa downstairs I call it a sofa it's a chair i'll tell you about that in a minute um my mum absolutely as soon as she saw this she wanted it and jolly good she wore and wore it easy easy to wear over the shoulders lovely and drapey so that's the habitation throw so similar wool with the floof and the the indie dyed yarns just different cons well this is a long shawl a long well it's like a scarf really i didn't do it quite the length she said because i'm short and it would drown me but and it goes on it's lovely. I have shown you before, but there we are. So, oh yes, we bought two new chairs. They're called love seats. You can they're wide enough so you can put your legs up if you want. I I don't sit like that. I'm not comfortable like that. But uh, it means that I've got room for my crafting whatever I'm doing. I can put it by the side. If people come to visit, then the two chairs uh, do sit two of you so that's four um, we would call it a two-seater sofa I think but th that's the name of it love chairs I'll put a photo here so it's changed the conservatory really it's rather nice um, I did desert island discs in the conservatory with Pete and uh, it's comfortable so at the minute I'm taking um well, on the 1st of May, I took a film of what was on my craft table. And then this morning, I took a film of how far I'd got with those crafts. So I'm going to put that up now. I'll see you in a minute then. Morning. What's on my crafting table this morning? Well, I'm a bit behind because I've got to do my tag for the 22nd to the 28th of April. Usually do it on a Sunday. I'm wondering why I didn't. I can't remember now. Um, so that I need to do PDQ, as we say. Otherwise, I'll forget. Um, I'm up to date. I'm enjoying doing them. I really am. 
and um, uh, yeah, I just write on the back, you know, everything that's happened that week. And it makes you condense it really. Well, makes me condense it. And because it's small, I can do it. Well, I bought some lace. It's absolutely gorgeous. I've got a little shop in the town. They're selling all this. I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful lace. Can you see that? I think he just got gets things from here and there and so he's selling all this at um a pound a meter i just couldn't resist it i just couldn't resist it it's so pretty and such good quality let me show you it's, it, it's so lovely. So I bought quite a nice little bits of that for for doing. Well, you know what for doing. I've got to put that away. But at the moment, I'm just enjoying looking at it. It's just so pretty. Um, so that's my tag. I've got this out because I want to do another five inch as relating to my book. I wanted to do last time, not last time, but the time before, I read that mum had a single bed and a chair <laughs> and no sink. But I was going to embroider a chair and a single bed, but I just, it was beyond me a bit. So, I read last week that Dad had written that I played with uh, beads in a jar. So I'm going to try and do a jar to put on my, um, you know, embroideries relating to my book. Pete asked me if I would knit him some blue socks to go with his <laughs> blue trousers. And... Uh, I bought some Exmoor sock John Arban because it is beautiful. Wortleberries. That's on my to-do list. Leave it out, it won't get forgotten. That's the thing, isn't it? When I put things away, they get forgotten. Um, I have got a pair of socks on the go for him. And this is the colour J. And that knits up West Yorkshire spinners. That knits up like that. So they're in my bag. Uh, these he's saying, oh, have you started my socks yet? Have you started my socks yet? But this is in my bag for, you know, for instance, last night uh, we, we had a doctor's appointment for him which went very, very well. Uh, but I took that with me while we were waiting. It, that's the sort of thing, just round and round and small in my bag. Stitch my Mrs. D. Very nice. And I was so pleased with my top-down sock, uh, not top-down sock, top-down jumper. I haven't taken it off. <laughs> um, I'm going to knit another one and I saw um, uh, the Woven Almanac, Dawn does once a month roughly and she showed the J sweater which is a top down and I'm, go I'm going to do that. I've got some felted tweed um, in my stash so I thought I'd, I'm not over keen on felted tweed. I love the colours but uh, it's, it's not really firm enough for me. It's a, quite a loose knit, um, but I've got it in my stash, so why not? So I'm going to start the J sweater top down next when I decide. And that's it, that's my stash. So that's what's on my craft table. So I bought a couple of books, a Debbie Bliss Cashmerino Aaron. I want to knit something for the autumn for Tommy and George and Mila. 
great-grandchildren. I like this for the boys. And for Mila, I want to do this. It's got a pretty yoke and then plain. Nice to go over dresses. And then I bought Simply Sweet. 64 miniature hand embroidery designs by Kathy Schmidt. You can buy the um, piece of fabric with them all printed on, should you so wish, from Spoonflower. But I, I won't do that. I just thought these would go very well on my um, macarons that I make. This is a cute one here. It won't take long to do, but they're a little bit different, aren't they? I can already see when I'm going to do that for my book because I went to dancing classes. How pretty that would look on the macaron. There's a lot here. Oh look, a little teacup with a tea bag. Washing line. Little acorn house, friend. Huh. And there we are, all the instructions. I'm going to enjoy using those. So that's my crafting table for this week. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll show you later how I got on with those uh, crafty bits. I went down a rabbit hole this week and uh, it was a very pleasant while I was down there. I think I went around the whole Warren because um, Lindsay of So Sweet Samuel, uh, she popped round her mum's house and her mum showed um, a cross stitch that she'd done many years ago and she said it was lavender and lace and I suddenly remembered that the one I showed you in a few episodes ago going down my hallway that's lavender and lace I said it was mirabilia but at the time I thought you know it isn't it's lavender and lace and I loved it and then I got thinking as I was down that rabbit hole I'd done another lavender and lace and completely forgotten everything about it. I mean, it is erased from my mind. And it was a cross stitch that I did for my daughter's wedding. Tom is Nan, Nicola. And uh, we'd been around there this, this weekend and I said, can I have a look at the cross stitch I did for you? And it's in the bedroom. And it's on the above the mantelpiece. It has it has discoloured. I did it in ivory silk because her wedding dress was ivory and not white. But you can see where the sun's come in through the window, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's lovely. But what shocked me was that uh, her wedding was in 1993, <laughs> and I would never have said that she's been married 31 years this year. I remember it like it was yesterday. And of course, as I was down that rabbit hole, making myself comfortable in the Warren, uh, I saw one that I'd really like to do. It's of a lady. I think that's the style lavender and lace. I found somewhere that sells it, which I mean, it is a 90s pattern. 
and you can tell I'm getting a bit excited, can't you? And it's with a little girl and the lady, and she's got a quilt on her lap. She's um, making making the quilt. I did think I almost bought it, but I haven't got any kits that are outstanding at all. No kits, just some stash of wool, some stash of fabric, and that's not too much. And um, I've got through the pile of things I showed you in a few videos ago of things that I didn't quite know what to do with. And they've all been dealt with, sorted out. And so really, I'm, I feel quite free. And at the minute, I'm doing my story, uh, the embroideries for that. And I'm doing some knitting. I might want to do some cross stitch, but it's rather a big undertaking. I think it would take me a good year to do it. And, you know... Do I want to commit myself to a year's worth of, of a kit? I'll see. So I came up from the rabbit hole, but uh, thank you, Lindsay's mum, for showing me uh, her, your work. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and taking me down memory lane of lavender and lace. Anyway, it's time for Desert Island Discs now. And I'll pop that up. Pete's on record five. And uh, yeah, he'd like to take it to the desert island because of the memories that it conjures up for him. <laughs> oh, it's time for desert. I oh, know. It's time for desert island discs. Oh, oh crumbs. crumbs. Oh, oh crumbs. It, that tests our memory, doesn't it? It does. But I have got my MacBook here, Thank goodness. which has got quite a few facts and figures in. Otherwise, it would just be facts and where... figures. Oh, not figures, just facts. Yes, yeah, that's it. Uh, I suppose that's school days, isn't it? Facts and figures. I suppose it is. Yeah, yeah. just facts. Well, <laughs> anyway, let's get started. <laughs> okay then. Uh, so, I've forgotten what number it is, but I, I should have told them what six. number it is. It might probably six. Six sounds yeah. like. Six sounds like. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah. What is it? What is it? Yeah. Oh, what what, what record is it? Yeah. Oh, it's uh, "Love Me Do" by the Beatles. Love, love me oh, too. Christ. Oh, I know I can't <laughs> sing. Well, I can sing sometimes, but mostly I can't. Right. You can sing. No. But of course, we've got copyright and all of that. Yeah, so yeah. if you're too young and you don't know what it is, you'll have to Google it. Yeah. But it was quite a something record. But it was different. It was different. I so can remember us... exactly where I was. Right. So before you tell us where yeah. you were, we left you in the London clubs yeah. and then you said, you know, things changed, it got a bit rowdy, and so you decided not to go back. Yeah. Um, so where did you go from there? We went everywhere, basically. Everywhere? Well, everywhere there was a, somewhere who played music. Um, jazz? No, not jazz. No. Oh, rhythm, rhythm and blues? Rhythm and blues, mostly. Yeah. Um, I think they. I think it was played in jazz clubs quite oh, a lot. Oh yeah, though. that's was, where it started. Yeah, that's, you know, we, we used to go to the blues room. The blues room. At, uh, where was that now? Manor House. Manor House. That's it. It says the Rolling Stones played weekly gigs at the Manor House yeah, they did. in February and March 1963 when the pub hosted the Haringey Jazz Club. Mm. Current uh, shortly before its closure. Bill Wyman commented that the Manor House was about the only Stones venue that still exists from the band's early days. The Who also performed at the Manor House in 1965. Mm. And there was a lot of famous people who played there and you used to go there. I went there myself once. Yeah, well, that was a few years old. Right at the beginning as well. Yeah. It was the sort of British... Um, Started to catch catch, catch on that the, the kids were, were liking ah American blues music really right and, and so they were playing it too so uh, a lot of the groups started doing it and they, and then they got the people coming in right but we went everywhere we went to Ilpie Island now Ilpie Island I've got something here it says it's an island eight to nine acres in the River Thames at Twickenham that's it. And it, the name come, may have come from eel pies, which were served by the inn on the island in the 19th century. Oops. <laughs> Excuse me. 
I think if I think if I ate eel pie, that's what it would do to yeah, me. I think so. Oh, anyway, <laughs> an inn was. About it. Oh, an inn was <laughs> on. Well, of course, is it is that jelly deals? Yep. Oh no. It probably was. And liquor. Deals, yeah. Oh, my family all loved that. And it was a genteel hotel in the 1920s and 30s. Then in 1956, Brian Rutland, who ran a local band called the Grove Jazz Band, started jazz sec sessions there. And then they realised that the youngsters yeah. like this rhythm and blues. Yeah. And it says Long John Broadry, yeah, Ackerbilk, right. Ken Collier. Well, Ackerbilk and Ken Collier were jazz yeah, they were. So they, they were tried jazz. Ah, well, they played there. Uh, John the, Mayall, George yeah, well, Melly, the Rolling Stones, Screaming Lord Such, yeah. the Who, the Yardbirds, Pink Floyd. Yeah. So, but we didn't see all of them. No, we, we only saw. We went, went now and again because it was quite. A, it, again, it was the Stones for you, wasn't well, it? Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, Long John Baldry. Long John like Baldry. Uh, okay, and then you said you went to. Klux Click. Klux Click. Let me find that page. Klux Click. I can't remember where it was. Klux Click. I had to look up how to spell it. K L O O K S K L E E K. And the founder was Dick Jordan, again a jazz enthusiast, yes. an aspiring trombonist. And you know, Don Rendell played the club a record 20 times. And we yeah. have met Don Rendell, yeah. haven't we? If you remember. I uh, do. Tubby Hayes, the best known jazzer of the time. And then it says that uh, they started opening it up, Rhythm and Blues, in 1963. The promoters became aware of a burgeoning scene in the blues and R&B. And it arrived at Klook's Clique in the shape of Georgie oh, Fame yeah. and the Blue Flames. Their first appearance yeah. at Klook's Clique was on a scheduled jazz night. That's it. And so they opened the Tuesday R&B nights on the 10th of September 1963 mm. and performed a further 21 times. And you used to go to Klook's Clique? Yeah. That was on a Tuesday. Yeah. Now we remembered... That on you, a Monday, yeah. we used to go to Tottenham Royal. Tottenham Royal, and so did I. I know it was a few years after yeah. you, but we used to go to the Tottenham Royal and I remembered it was Monday and Thursday. Yeah. We used to go Monday and Thursday nights. And that's where my mum and dad met at the Tottenham <laughs> Royal. So, yeah, that's quite quite a place. It, it's, to... off the, it's off the record there. There wasn't many groups. It, it was. It was uh, all records. I mean, a lot of American records still. Yeah. And, the, and the, the new sort of copies of the American. Yeah. And also doing pinching their music, really. Yeah. You know, like, and it says here, at, back at um, Klook's Clique, that um, Moody Blues, John Lee Hooker, Howling Wolf, <laughs> all uh -huh. these names. Yeah. So, you were Tottenham Royal, Klook's Clique, Manor House. Yeah. But also, somewhere else, the brakes. Oh, the brakes at Hatfield. Yeah. Yeah, well, that Hatfield's out, going out, going up to north. From Potts Bar. Right, Hatfield? It? Hatfield, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was, it says, in the few years following World War II, there was a variety of youth clubs set up. Mm. During the early 1960s, many famous pop groups appeared in the breaks, self built dance hall, such as Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. Yeah, we like them, they're good, he was. The Tremolos, yeah, the um, Zombies. Yeah, not so much. So, this record. Yeah. Is Love Me Do by the Beatles. Yeah, well, that's completely different because it was a completely different sound. Right. I was in the coffee bar at, at Potter's Bar by the station. Okay. I can remember it. And we were in there. We used to meet and we used to muck about there on our scooters and things. October 1962. Yeah. About, yeah, it must have yes. been. Yeah. And um, we were just there. And suddenly this record came on. And I said... What the heck's that? Who's that? And we didn't know. So we went over it and it was the Beatles, whoever they were. Yeah. And um, anyway, it was so, somehow it was different. Um, 
it was different to anything else. Yeah. It says the song was written several years before being recorded mm. and prior to the existence of the Beatles. It features John Lennon's prominent harmonica playing and duet vocals by him and Paul McCartney. I've chosen it because I, it's something that reminds me of all that. We were on scooters and we yes. soon to be have cars and yeah. then we used to go out further. Right. And we were still going out to all round, but of course, those days... Um, you went out every night, you said? Every night. Yeah. yeah every night. Well, we better go because this, otherwise this my whole episode is oh, going to be yeah. taken up with our ramblings. Oh, kind of that. oh exactly. <laughs> so we'll say cheerio yeah. and see you next time. Right, see you next time. Yeah. So how did I get on with my crafting this week? Okay. Well, before I tell you how I've got on, I want to show you this. This is something I made quite some time ago, and I hope you can see it. Um, but you know the uh, pens that we use and then you iron it, the heat takes the pen away. Well, I have been told that it can come back. And usually when I mark things on things, I mark it for a cutting line. But on this, I just drew the little, you know, flowers on to show me where I was going to do my embroidery. And I, well, I noticed the other day, can you see how the line, that was the line I was going to pull it over. It's all the way round. It's come back. And also on here, where I drew the flowers, the line has come back. So I just wanted to say, be careful when you use those heat erasable pens, because this one is coming back. I've tried putting a hairdryer on it and no, no, no luck. I'm going to try with an iron and I shall let you know when I next film if that worked. But I don't really want to iron on there because there's plastic underneath, so it wouldn't need to be too hot. But I'll see. I'll let you know if it, if I get rid of it. So just a little bit of warning there. <clears throat> I put my lace away. So that's gone. I've done my... Um, I've done my... Uh, yes, caught up to date with that. Um, I've done this for my book i did the beads in the jar that i wrote about and when i just checked in my book that my dad wrote up uh, my baby book uh, it said that i used to sit there and open the paper i think papers were quite big then so i must have been quite as a little girl and nine months old and sit and open the paper and read it. And I would say, obbity gobbity, obbity gobbity. I don't remember all my life. Mum and Dad just saying, obbity gobbity, obbity gobbity. And so I think that, you know, that was my say. I, I was a chatterbox right from the word go. So that is what I have done. And I'm going to sew it onto my family that I'm going to do. I'll show you that when I do my chat. Okay, so I've done that little embroidery. Uh, I've, I've done a bit on the socks because we went round and visited uh, my daughter and we saw Tommy and yeah, the family. And so these are now going to be not for Pete, but these are going to be for my son-in-law, Mike. He loves them. So I carried on knitting until the end and then I thought oh, I'm going to wait till I turn the heel. So this is the J as I've told you. I do mine for the men, 72 stitches and I do it on 2.25. That's what the pattern says, I've always done it. You see, yeah, 2.25, quite fine. I love doing 4.25 for you know the needle dpns so that's my sock so i shall turn the heel on that 
this coming week and um, I'm tempted to start peat socks I don't usually have more you know I usually try and get things finished before I start something else but Mike's not in a rush for this so I'll see I'll see what I decide crafting is decision time okay and then I've just got this left in my stash <laughs> I've made good headway with my jumper and here it is it's the J sweater and I'll pop a picture up here of me trying on the bodice the uh, yoke rather not the bodice it's come up bigger than uh, my green one I put, I've, for, I've forgotten what that's called I'll put it on the screen you know the one I finished last time uh, it is big I did a, a pico hem because I love it I love the way that just sits flat on on your body and this is going to be a pull-on just uh, yeah a comfortable comfortable sweater she said on the J sweater, it is a free pattern, so I can say, she said, do the yoke on 4.5 and then the rest of the body on a 4. I did that on a 4 and it doesn't show up very well because it's a, it's a variegated yarn. Both of them are. And so, therefore, you've got a lot of colour going in, but it's pretty. It's, you know it's it's good enough uh, certainly for for being at home and well we'll see i don't know if it'll be at home or, or for going out walking or what we'll see we'll see what happens but it is it has come up much bigger than my other sweater but i, I do feel this might be the wool um as i said so i've got i put this on and when you do this you pop your needle in there, a nice push, and then it's so simple. And it means that you can try your sweater on at all different stages, which I did for, you know, round here. Let's see. Let's see. Pull that through. You can pull on it. It doesn't come off. How good is that? Take it off. And my stitches are ready for knitting. Now, all I've got, I, this is why I did the pink on the bottom. I'm not too keen on having a bottom. Well, it, it's not too bad, but it's. I would have preferred it all plain. But uh, I did a fade, what they call a fade. Um, obviously it doesn't look like a fade here, but that, that's how to blend, blend the next bit of wool. And so I thought, well, I'll try a fade and see if it works. And yes, it looks all right, I think. And that's all I've got left, as I've said. So I'm going to divide that into, um, 50 grams. No, that's 50 grams. I'm going to divide it into 25 grams each. I've got a little bit there, oh, and a little bit there. So I'm going to divide that in half. I'm going to knit the sleeve as long as I can. And then I've got this to finish it off. So that's what I've been doing this week. So there we are, record five done and some crafting done too. I'm pleased with the jumper. As I say, I've got the sleeves to do now. There we are in the better light. You can see the pattern. It's pretty. But with the two variegated uh, yarns, um, you know, it doesn't quite stand out as much. It's nice. I like it. So I'm going to try and get those sleeves done. And here's the obbity gobbity obbity gobbity. That will be sewn.
on the bottom there. Oh, a little story is coming together. We'll see what comes next time. So it's time for my story. Resoundedly, everybody said, yes, please keep reading it. So your wish is my command <laughs> and I'll read you a little bit more. Grandad had found out about properties to rent that would give them a new opportunity for better living. And so we moved to Harlow just before I was two. I've been back to visit, which was a lovely surprise for me. Actually, that was in 2003. I took some photos and I can't believe it was, you know, so long ago that I did this. But uh, it was a lovely surprise at the time. Anyway, back to the book. At the Harlow Museum, I found out why the new town had been built and what life was like there at the time. Mum and Dad must have felt like pioneers being the first tenants in the flat at 169 Tannisdale. London had been badly bombed. 27,000 houses declared seriously damaged or uninhabitable and the government of 1946 felt it necessary to introduce the New Towns Act. This wasn't just because of the lack of housing. Over-industrialisation had taken its toll and bad smogs and poor environment had led to poor health. So planners decided that town and country should be brought together. In 1945, there was a change in leadership as Clement Attlee replaced Winston Churchill as prime minister. Attlee and the Labour Party created the National Health Service and nationalized many industries, including coal, gas and electricity. The New Towns Act was just another example of the socialist changes sweeping Britain, changes which mum and dad were happy to be part of. The master plan of Harlow itself was drawn up in 1947 by Sir Frederick Gibbard. The blueprint specified the creation of a central civic area surrounded by a series of self-sufficient neighbourhoods each equipped with its own amenities and landscape wedges of green space. The town centre was known as the High and was the first in the country to have a pedestrian precinct. The Lawn, Britain's first tower block, was constructed in 1951. Harlow's village population was 4,500 and in 1952 the figure was likely to rise to 80,000. Harlow Newtown was built alongside rather than around the village. So you can visit Old Harlow, which remains village-like and has two grade one listed buildings. The M11 was built in the 1970s. So from a village, Harlow escalated. My flat is in a park which was designated a conservation area in 1987 and near to Old Harlow. Photos of me outside Tannisdale showed that it was still very much under construction when we moved in the spring of 1952. We had to walk over rough ground to get to the shops and building was underway in every direction. Mum said it was considered a gift to live there, with most people working in construction or in purpose-built factories. In this new town being created around us, we had a two bedroom flat. It had a balcony, large windows, a fully equipped kitchen and bathroom, living room and two bedrooms. To cap it all, the countryside was on our doorstep. Dad still carried on working in London and I didn't see him much. A vague recollection is his car, a small Austin 7. His friend said the birds could fly faster. I remember standing on the running board, which at some point fell off. It was exciting. With family away, away in London, I had an imaginary friend. She was called Matilda. 
Mum said she'd often find me under the table in conversation. I still like to chat. I started young by the sounds of it. So it's time for Cheerio and I'll see you soon. And the film this week is Our Garden Having a Haircut. And last weekend I went, well we, we went out for a meal with the family and uh, little Tommy was there and our granddaughter Lois. So there's just a little bit of film at the end of him. So I'll see you next time. Do take care. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, as usual, till next time. Bye bye. Well done. 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 Well done.